All right, we're wrapping up the semester, and it would not be psychology if we didn't talk about psychological disorders. So it's hard to say what is a psychological disorder. You might see somebody's behavior, and it might be weird or odd, or it might be different from what you consider as normal, but how do we, as psychologists or people who study psychology, determine what is a disorder? Well, the first thing is, is the behavior abnormal? Based off of how we expect humans to normally behave, do we consider that abnormal, right? Having one or two pets in your home, normal. Seven, eight, abnormal. 20, abnormal, right? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a diagnosable disorder. It just means that the behavior is abnormal. In order for it to meet the criteria of being a disorder, we need to see behavior that is an excess or deficiency of what's considered normal, right? So somebody who has too many pets or even somebody who has no pets. Why don't you have any pets? What's wrong with you? Do you not like caring for something that constantly needs your attention? Does anybody want to adopt my cat? I have had to retake so many uh, of these lecture recordings just because he keeps on meowing. Uh, no, just kidding. I love him. I am holding him still right now. He loves me too. Uh, now, behavior, uh, the last thing that you need, aside from a cat that will just be quiet for just like an hour maybe, can you do that, uh, is you need to see that there is distress or impairment. So if I have 30 cats, but it's not affecting my work life, it's not affecting my uh, uh, friendships, right, or my romantic life, it's not a disorder. But once it's causing me some sort of impairment or causing me personal distress, then we are saying that it's a disorder. If uh, I hear voices every so often and they tell me, hey, Jeff, have a great day, right? Uh, hey, Jeff, you're doing great. Yeah, uh, I am probably hallucinating, but that isn't necessarily the diagnosable criteria for schizophrenia. When those voices are starting to make my life hard to live, or they're impairing my ability to relate to other people, that's when it meets the criteria for a diagnosable disorder. So let's start talking about the mood disorders. Uh, the big mood disorder is, of course, major depressive disorder, depression. Uh, now, well, we can all feel depressed at some point in our lives. If you have a disappointment uh, or uh, some sort of like loss, you might feel depressed, right? You apply to a school that you really want to get into, depression, uh, if you don't get into it. A family member that you really cared about passes, depression. Now, the uh, major depressive disorders, when this happens, far in advance of what would be considered normal. Uh, you know, you don't get into the school uh, and, you know, you might be depressed for a month or two. Uh, but if you're continuing to be depressed for two, three years, then that's when we're seeing uh, that excessive behavior, right? That's far in advance of what you would consider normal. So some of the symptoms that you might see are persistent depressed mood for most days, right? Uh, it doesn't, uh, sometimes it doesn't really uh, respond to good things. So maybe, you know, you're having a great conversation with somebody cute on a dating app, but even though this good thing is happening, you're still feeling depressed. You might have feelings of worthlessness or guilt. You might experience loss of pleasure or anhedonia. Uh, so hedonia, hedonism, if you ever see the prefix a or an, that means without, so without pleasure, uh, changes in appetite or sleep, these can be increases or decreases, so some people have uh, not a great appetite when they're depressed, some people eat a lot when they're depressed, 
some people you'll see them uh, engage in uh, or not engage but rather experience hypersomnia where they feel uh, like they need more sleep and they're more tired during the day some people will experience insomnia where they have a very hard time falling asleep and staying asleep and also social withdrawal where people are less interested in doing the things that they normally do uh, and then tied with anhedonia when they do those things they don't enjoy them like they used to right so i finally get out of bed and hang out with my friends but uh, i don't really enjoy it very much right uh so a uh a big concern in depression aside from the fact that it just feels terrible are uh, uh thoughts of death and suicidal ideation now suicidal ideation is normal during uh, depression. Uh, whenever you see suicidal ideation, that's usually a red flag. A normal healthy brain doesn't think about dying all the time. It doesn't think about self-harm, right? Uh, so if you're seeing that or hearing that, that is a very clear sign that someone maybe not uh, might not be sp experiencing major depressive disorder, but could be uh, going through some sort of depression. Now, uh, when you're looking at suicidal ideation, the big concern, especially uh, if you're a therapist or anybody uh, working with this person, uh, is suicide, uh, their chances of actually uh, making a suicidal attempt. Now, we have a way of gauging suicidal risk uh, and uh, that is by assessing plans, means, and a set time. Uh, you can remember PMS. Uh, so the, uh, I didn't make that up. A uh, teacher taught me that a long time ago. Uh, just in case you thought that I was very clever. Nope, I stole that. Uh, so the more of these a person has, the more at risk they are. So let's say... I were talking to a client of mine uh, who, if I were a therapist, I'm talking to my client, and they say, you know, sometimes I really wish that I, I could just like go to sleep and not wake up. I might say, have you ever had thoughts of harming yourself? And they might say, no, right? They could also say, yeah, sometimes I just want to climb up on top of a bridge uh, and then jump off, right? Uh, now, that is a specific plan, right? There is a difference between somebody who has these general feelings of suicidal ideation, recurring thoughts of death, versus somebody who has a specific idea of what they'd like to do. Now, once you've assessed for a plan, you might also want to assess for the means, right? Somebody could say, I want to jump into a pool filled with piranha and have them eat me alive, but do they have a pool filled with piranha, right? Do they know how to get a pool filled with piranha? Do they even have a pool or a bathtub, right? People's access to the thing related to their plan uh, is going to tell you how likely they are to go through the suicidal attempt. If somebody says that they want to swallow a bunch of pills and you say, well, do you have any access to pills that would be dangerous? And it's like, I got aspirin and melatonin. They're less at risk than somebody who's like, yeah, my grandmother had a surgery recently and she's got a uh, closet full, or not a closet, uh, a medicine cabinet filled with oxy, uh, and I could just uh, sneak in and grab like a few really easily. That's somebody who's more at risk. And then finally, we have set time. When we're looking at set time, sometimes people might have a fully thought out plan. So they have the, uh, the plan, they have the means, and they're saying, well, uh, this Friday, I'm just going to do it, right? Uh, and that set time means that they are highly at risk, 
right? So by uh, by assessing all three of these things, we can understand how much intervention needs to be made, right? Uh, and how much at risk a person uh, is to themselves. So you always want to make sure to discuss suicide with uh, a, a client. A lot of people are hesitant to do it because they're worried that mentioning suicide to somebody will increase their likelihood of doing it. But more than likely, what will happen is if they are thinking about doing it, then you can talk about it, right? If they are not thinking about doing it, then they won't think about doing it. Uh, so you definitely want to have uh, these conversations in a clinical setting to make sure that somebody isn't going to harm themselves. There are a variety of ways of intervening, so it is going to depend on how much uh, of a risk you think they are to themselves. So sometimes it's just a matter of checking in and saying, hey, I know that you've been feeling pretty down. Uh, are you okay? Do you think you'll, will I see you next week? Those types of things, making future plans can be very helpful. Uh, also, just having a plan of like, so let's say Wednesday you're feeling worse, right? And you, uh, and things do get pretty bad for you and you are thinking about doing it. Uh, who would you call? Would you call me? Do you have my office number? Do you know that in an emergency you can call and somebody will get back to you within, uh, you know, the hour? Uh, if you're, did you know that you can call 911? Do you, like, explaining to people, like, what their options are so that they can know. Sometimes people feel very hopeless. Some people don't even know that there's a national suicide hotline, right? Finally, in cases where somebody is at great risk to themselves but not willing to do anything about it, you can uh, put them under a hold. Uh, that's what's referred to as a 5150, where they're hospitalized against their will. Obviously, this is not the preferred method, right? The best method would be for them to commit themselves, uh, but in the case where you can save somebody's life, that is what you would want to do. Uh, so, depression can be, uh, or, I mean, all these are serious uh, uh disorders, but in some cases, uh, you're dealing with somebody's uh, potential of losing their lives. So you really want to be aware of how serious it can get so that you're prepared uh, to help the person through that. There's also dysthymic disorder, which is now known as persistent depressive disorder. You can think of this as the Eeyore disease. You might be familiar with the blue stuffed donkey from Winnie the Pooh. He uh, does not meet the criteria for major depressive disorder, but he has this persistent depressive kind of low-grade depression. Right uh, now, the uh, so the thymic disorder or persistent depressive disorder is kind of this consistent pattern of uh, low grade depression. Now, obviously, this causes Eeyore some distress, but he's not uh, engaging in self harm. Uh, he isn't suicidal. He just feels pretty low all the time, and he's very negative. Sometimes what can happen is what's called double depression, where somebody who experiences persistent depressive disorder can also have uh, instances of major depressive disorder. So they go from dysthymic to major depressive disorder, then back to dysthymic. That's called double depression. Some people experience uh, what's called seasonal affective disorder. So they'll feel depressed during certain times of the year. 
for a lot of people, these are the winter months, uh, partially because you're getting less sunlight, you're staying in home uh, at home more, it's colder, uh, but also holidays for a lot of people are a very depressing time. If you've lost family members, you remember them more uh, because you realize and remember that they're not there. Uh, you might feel lonelier during the holidays, right? During the winter, you have Thanksgiving, you have Christmas, you have Hanukkah, you have Kwanzaa, you have New Year's, right? Uh, and then in February, there's Valentine's Day. So back to back, you have a lot of holidays that are telling you, why are you alone? Uh, so seasonal affective disorder uh, is... Uh, specifically when people experience depression during a specific uh, uh, time of the year. So in major depressive disorder, you might have a period of time where you are feeling depressed. That's what's referred to as a depressive episode. Now, sometimes you can experience uh, what's called a hypomanic or a manic episode. The difference between a hypomanic or manic episode is the severity. So manic episodes are more severe than hypomanic episodes. Hypo means below. So if you think of uh, the term hypothermia, that happens when your body is too cold. It's below its normal temperature. If you think about a hypodermic needle, which is what you would use to give yourself a shot, the dermis is the skin. What does a hypodermic needle do? It goes below the skin. Isn't that cool? So hypomania is less severe than mania. Now, when looking at manic and hypomanic episodes, they're basically the opposite of depression. Uh, so you might feel overly happy. Uh, for long periods of time. You might uh, talk very fast and have racing thoughts. It might be easier for you to get distracted. Uh, you might be overconfident in your abilities, and you might engage in risky behavior, such as gambling, right? Uh, so sometimes you'll see somebody uh, who is experiencing tangential thinking, and it's like uh, a very pressured speech. Uh, so let's say I, I, I had this idea that I need to tell you. Uh, oh, so like orange juice, right? Everybody, everybody's talking about orange juice, and the vitamins are just so so. A lot of the the vitamins uh, we lose a lot of vitamins, and so many of them they're just uh, so like. Um, really just health in general is a thing that um, so like uh, so it's like a million dollar idea and basically what well, we're like the, the chemicals need to be less right uh, so what uh, if somebody were pitching you this idea uh, you can see that they have something that they're trying to say there's a lot of like uh, energy behind it uh, but they're going from idea to idea, tangential thinking. Uh, so, uh, but this idea is a million dollar idea, right? Uh, they've already taken out a personal loan for this idea. Uh, they're overconfident. They're like, well, I don't need a business degree uh, because uh, I watched a YouTube video last night. Uh, now, again, uh, some people might be like that normally. Uh, as Americans, our pride and joy is being overconfident in our abilities, but this is in excess of what would be considered normal, right? Uh, so uh, hypomania might just be uh, general, uh, like, overconfidence, but mania uh, is would be a severe version of that, right? So I'm not sure if you see me in person, uh, I'm 5'10", uh, so, and I'm not super athletic. I, you know, can catch a ball here and there, but there's no way that I'm going to be drafted into the NBA at the tender age of 37 and a half, uh, which is my actual age. Definitely not lying to you. Uh, so I, uh, if I suddenly think 
that uh, the NBA is going to call me any moment. Or if I start telling you that the NBA has been calling me and uh, I have a very hard time uh, or I've had a hard, hard time all week because five different teams are trying to put me on and I can't pick if I want to be on the Jazz or the Bulls or the Lakers or the Clippers or the uh, uh, Kings, uh, any of those basketball teams uh, because uh, they all want me to play for them. Uh, the LA Kings actually became a basketball team just because they wanted me on their team so bad, right? That would look, that would be mania. Sometimes the difference between mania and hypomania is uh, the presence of those uh, sometimes psychotic and delusional uh, thoughts, right? Uh, so once a person start, uh, starts hallucinating or having delusions, that bumps you into mania. Now, when it comes to diagnosis, in order to have a diagnosis of bipolar 1, all you need is one manic episode, right? So you don't even need to technically be bipolar to be diagnosed with bipolar 1. But for bipolar 2, you need to have one hypomanic and one depressive episode. Once you have a manic episode, that bumps you up to bipolar 1. The, if you ever experience a manic episode, your diagnosis is bipolar 1. And more than likely, it's going to stick with you even if seven years later you've only had hypomanic and depressive episodes. And the reason for that is because it's very important to know if somebody can have manic episodes because certain treatments, if you are just treating the depressive part, might bump somebody into a manic episode. Uh, so it's very important to understand that. So uh, in bipolar, uh, depending on which one you're talking about, you can have manic episodes, you can have hypomanic episodes, you can have depressive episodes, and sometimes you can have mixed episodes. So if somebody's showing uh, hypomanic and depressive symptoms or even manic and depressive uh, symptoms in the same period of time, that would be a mixed episode. Uh, so that's bipolar 1 and 2. So remember, no matter how long you've had bipolar 2 or even how long you've had major depressive disorder, once you have that manic episode, you're bipolar 1. So now let's talk about anxiety disorders. Anxiety is basically your body's fear response, right? Back in the day when there were saber-toothed tigers and uh, other <laughs> threats to our existence, uh, things that would actually hunt and kill us, we need that fear response in order to trigger uh, the sympathetic nervous system, uh, which is the fight or flight response, right? And then we either fight it off or run away. Now that we don't have saber-toothed tigers that are hunting us, we worry about things like why we didn't get enough likes on our Instagram post, or why our voice sounds weird when it's recorded, but sounds normal when we're speaking, right? Am I a different person? Is that really what people hear? Yes, right? So anxiety disorders are when we have anxiety in excess of what is considered normal. It's okay to have anxiety, it's okay to be afraid, but when it's in excess, then uh, we have an issue. So we have panic disorder. Now, sometimes people will experience panic attacks, uh, which if you've never had one, great for you. Uh, they are horrible, you feel like you are dying, uh, different people are going to have different experiences of them, but some people feel like there's impending doom or danger. Uh, you feel this loss of control or you feel like you're dying. Your heart might be pounding out of your chest. There might be sweating, trembling or shaking, shortness of breath, tightness in your throat and body, right? Uh, they're not a fun experience. People who have frequent panic attacks might have what is called panic disorder. Now, we also have generalized anxiety disorder where sometimes people just feel anxious about a variety of situations. 
Uh, so we'll talk about uh, some of the more specific forms of anxiety in a second, but sometimes, you know, you wake up and uh, you might be stressed that you might not have enough time to get ready and then you're leaving the house and you have your stress that your uh, home might like catch fire while you're gone uh, and then you're driving and you're afraid that you're going to get into an accident and you're in class and you're afraid that your professor's going to call on you and he won't know the answer or that uh, you smell bad and nobody tells you that you smell bad, right? Uh, so you're seeing anxiety about a variety of topics in a variety of situations. That's why it's generalized. Uh, we have more specific forms of anxiety. One is agoraphobia, which is uh, when you are avoidant of places or situations that might make you feel panicked or trapped. Uh, so for example, I might decide that I don't want to go to the mall because when you go to the mall, sometimes you're looking for a store and you, uh, you try to find one of those maps in the mall, but you can't find the map. So you're wandering around and then you get lost. And what happens if you're lost forever and somebody sees you wandering around and they think that you're like a criminal who's trying to like case to join and then you get arrested, right? So it's better to just stay home. Or I want to go visit my friends uh, who live in downtown. But what happens if I, you know, get stuck on the freeway and then I have to use the restroom? Or I'm trying to find parking and there's no parking and the only place that has parking uh, is like a cash-only lot. And I have, uh, or I had cash, but I forgot to bring it with me. And then they say that I have to go to the ATM, uh, but it's three blocks away and they won't let me leave my car. So I have to find a place to park my, right? So there's this fear of going into situations where you'll be trapped or you'll be embarrassed, right? Uh, there's also social anxiety, which is specifically related to social situations. There can be some overlap with agoraphobia, uh, but it's a similar thing of like, uh, oh, um, I was on Facebook and two weeks ago, uh, I, you know, sent my friend a, uh, I liked their status, uh, but it was funny. And uh, so I should have said, haha, but then, uh, and now they're probably really mad at me because they haven't like messaged me. And uh, they probably noticed that I liked it and they thought that I was being passive aggressive, which I wasn't. And if I reach out to them now, then uh, they're going to say, why did it take you so long to apologize? And they're going to be even madder at me, right? So uh, social situations are anxiety provoking. Uh, or you're talking to somebody and then you do that thing where you both start talking at the same time. And that's just a normal thing that happens. But you might go, oh, this person thinks that I'm so rude and that I'm not listening to them. And I'm so terrible, right? That would be social anxiety disorder. Then we have specific phobias. Specific phobias, uh, aside from agoraphobia or social anxiety disorder, are a fear of a specific thing in excess of the actual danger. So, uh, like, a fear of being robbed at gunpoint is a normal fear. Now, if you are walking... Uh, like in your neighborhood uh, during the day uh, in a well-lit public place, right, where there are other people, your chances of getting robbed at gunpoint are very low, right? Uh, so if you felt that fear all the time uh, for that specific thing, that would be a specific phobia. Or if you think about snakes, right? Some snakes, very dangerous. You should have some amount of fear when you see them. Other snakes, not dangerous at all, right? A little garter snake, uh, garden snake, garter snake, garden, I always for, gar yeah, garter snake. Uh, so the, uh, you see a little garter snake, that little thing's not gonna hurt you. Uh, you see like a daddy long legs, right? That little buddy's not gonna hurt you. He's a daddy. Uh, at some point, He'll be a zaddy long legs. Put a little bow tie on him. That is one hot daddy. Uh, so 
those things will not hurt you, but we can be afraid of them, right? So that fear in excess of the actual danger makes it a specific phobia. It could be of public speaking. It can be of, uh, you know, spiders or clowns or the dark or enclosed spaces. Uh, all of these uh, are specific phobias. So similar, uh, but classified differently is, uh, or classified separately, is obsessive compulsive disorder. Obsessions are thoughts. Uh, these thoughts can be about uh, contamination, getting sick, uh, losing control, harming somebody, losing important items, right? Uh, so if you've ever done the uh, like pocket check, before you leave the house, right? Uh, phone, keys, wallet, uh, bag of sand, right? You gotta, you can't leave house without your bag of sand. Uh, that is an obsession. Now, we all have obsessions, we all have compulsions, right? Uh, if you touch something gross, right? Uh, you, uh, if you've ever done the thing where you put your hand under a desk and it bumps onto somebody's gum, right? you have an obsession in that moment with contamination where you go, this is gross, I need to wash my hands, right? So you wash your hands maybe once, twice, right? Uh, that is a normal obsession and compulsion, right? Uh, you uh, change your kid's diaper uh, and maybe they uh, like uh, uh, pee a little bit or you get like a little dab of poop on you that is the joy of parenthood, right? You have a little fear of contamination, it's a little gross, you wash your hands. Sometimes what happens is those uh, obsessions and compulsions get out of control, right? Uh, so there's nothing wrong with, uh, oh, um, I'm walking to my car, did I lock my, uh, did I lock uh, my door? And then going back and checking the doorknob once right if you check it twice you know that's fine if you check it three times you're playing with no that's a different thing that's a song uh but uh somebody who's checking multiple times and goes back into the house to make sure that it's still locked from the inside so somebody can't you know uh jimmy open the window and then unlock the door like that uh but also checking to make sure that all the windows are locked and then also making sure uh that the oven is turned on and then checking again and then checking the windows again and then checking the door again right uh when the uh obsessions become so consuming that the compulsions start to take a toll on your life, that's when you're seeing obsessive compulsive disorder. So sometimes I hear people say, oh, I love having my pens organized. I'm so OCD, right? Wanting organization does not make you OCD, even if you're more organized than the normal person, or even if your organization method is bizarre or slightly uh, um, uh, excessive. There's also something called obsessive compulsive personality disorder, which is that kind of rigidity and that necessity of having things be your way and the right way all the time, which a lot of people confuse having obsessive compulsive traits uh, or obsessive compulsive personality disorder with OCD. But OCD is not a fun, silly, like, quirk that some people have. It's a very debilitating disorder, right? Washing your hands a couple times, or, you know, uh, especially now, uh, where we're like, maybe we sh as a country should wash our hands more. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're washing your hands for 10, 15 minutes a day or uh, a session just to make sure that they're clean because you're so afraid of being contaminated and you're washing your hands so much that they become dry and cracked and you're bleeding, right? You rub your skin raw. That is when you're seeing obsessive compulsive disorder in a very severe form. So it's not, it's not just like, 
oh, I like organization, I have OCD, it has to be a disorder in order for you to get the diagnosis. You may have heard of post-traumatic stress disorder before, or PTSD. It's often discussed when talking about people coming home from war. Uh, that is honestly when it started to be studied. People were coming back from the world wars with uh, shell shock uh, is one of the things that used to be called. And the more we studied it, the more we started to understand how traumatic uh, events can affect us. But it doesn't just need to be war combat. If you were held at gunpoint, if you were uh, uh, in a car accident, uh, if you were a victim of child abuse, you could experience post-traumatic stress disorder. And post-traumatic stress disorder is essentially when these traumatic experiences come back uh, in memories or nightmares, uh, or sometimes you might avoid specific uh, situations that trigger those emotions, right? So if I were uh, uh, beaten up on Citrus College's campus, uh, then I might avoid it because every time I see that sign as I'm driving up, I think about how I was punched and punched and punched, right? And also kicked a bit. Uh, it can also negatively affect my mood and my thinking as my brain starts to obsess and ruminate over that. Uh, and uh, I can also uh, experience nightmares uh, and th other things that are similar can trigger that. So sometimes uh, if you had a negative experience related to gunfire, right, uh, if you are in a place where there's a fireworks show that might trigger those memories. Uh, so post-traumatic stress disorder, usually, right, our brains will focus on a uh, trauma for a little bit of time, and then we'll be able to uh, balance out and, you know, uh, work through it. But sometimes we have a very hard time letting go of a uh, traumatic experience and processing it properly and it continues to affect us long after the original trauma occurred. And then there's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD. Some of you might remember a time when it was two separate disorders, ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder, and ADHD, uh, but, a, uh, but now we consider them one diagnosis with three different subtypes. So we have inattentive, hyperactive, impulsive, or combined. Uh, so inattentive, uh, ADHD, you'll see that people are easily distracted, they're unorganized, and they have a uh, difficulty listening because it's very hard to focus on one task. Uh, when you're looking at the hyperactive impulsive, this is the difficulty set, uh, sitting still, uh, so tapping or fidgeting. Uh, they might rush through tests uh, or uh, rush through tasks. Uh, so uh, instead of um, deliberately focusing on one thing at a time, they might try to just get everything done. Uh, and they also might be prone to make impulsive decisions. Some people might have qualities of both. Uh, that would be the combined type. So maybe you uh, fidget, uh, you are unorganized, you have difficulties listening, and you're impulsive. Uh, so. ADHD is usually first diagnosed in childhood, and the thing about it is people often rush to a diagnosis of ADHD. Uh, in my opinion, there are kind of uh, two camps. There's a camp that goes, uh, uh, ADHD isn't uh, a real thing. Uh, they're just people making it up. Uh, a kid just needs a good slap on the butt, uh, and uh, that will show them what's what, right? Back in my day, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but ADHD is a real thing. The other side is the over uh, um, 
uh, diagnosing side, which says everything uh, that is wrong with a child can just be lumped into ADHD. But that's not the case, right? Some of these uh, things that we see could be an issue of uh, other, uh, could be a result of other issues. So, for example, uh, sometimes a student might be hyperactive, right? Uh, now, some students are just more energetic than others, right? Uh, sometimes students are hyperactive because it gives them attention, right? Uh, if I'm tapping during class and, like, uh, you know, I see uh, other students, like, laughing at me and going, like, Jeff's bad, right? Uh, and uh, that gets me sent out of the uh, classroom. And then everybody's like, ooh, right? That gives me uh, attention. People uh, are focused on me. Uh, I'm getting in trouble, right? I can leave class if I want to. That's great. So sometimes uh, uh, the behavioral issue isn't ADHD. It's something else. If a student isn't paying attention in class, it could be that they have ADHD or it could be that they don't understand the material and they need additional help. But may, some students don't want to, uh, uh, don't want to ask for help, right? Uh, or difficulty listening. It could be ADHD. It could be a language processing issue. Uh, some students you might see that they're not taking notes. Is it because they're not paying attention? Is it because they can't see the board? Uh, for a good chunk of fifth grade and a little bit of sixth grade, I was struggling to see the board in class, and I didn't know that it was something that could be fixed. Like, I, in my childhood mind, I just thought that people who had glasses always had glasses, and people who did not have glasses never, like, got glasses later, right? Uh, but then one day I, like, explained that I could not see the board, and then uh, my, I can remember if my, I told my teacher and the teacher told my mom, or if uh, I told my mom, uh, but then she's like, oh, yeah, we should get your eyes checked, and I got glasses, and then I was like, oh, now I can see the board and take notes, right? So uh, a lot of times there are other things that could uh, be the reason for uh, these symptoms that look like ADHD, vision uh, or uh, auditory issues, right? Uh, it could be dyslexia. It could be a lack of interest in the subject matter, right? Some teachers just aren't good at teaching. Uh, that's when you guys say, you're one of those teachers, Professor Thompson, and then I break down crying. Thank you. You destroyed me. Uh, but there are all these things that you need to rule out before you give the diagnosis of ADHD. But it is a very real disorder. Speaking of controversial disorders, let's talk about autism spectrum disorder. Autism spectrum disorder uh, used to be several different disorders including autism disorder, Asperger's syndrome, and Rett's disorder. But what sometimes happens as we release a new version of the DSM-5, which is a book that we use in order to diagnose mental illnesses, is we realize that certain diseases are more related to one another than we thought. Sometimes we realize that something that we called a disease isn't. Uh, so things change, our understandings of disorders change, and thus our diagnoses and diagnostic criteria change. So instead of having three separate diseases, we are uh, looking at one disease uh, with a spectrum of functioning. So uh, one, just going to say this once. Vaccines do not cause autism. You can actually see signs of autism in children before the they receive vaccines. Um, I have uh, friends who have worked with autistic children, 
And the common thing that they say is that uh, autistic children tend to be easier because they don't cry as much, if at all, with autism, uh, and that's anecdotal evidence, so uh, you won't find that in a textbook, probably. But uh, with autism spectrum disorder, you're seeing difficulties with social interaction and uh, communication, and sometimes you'll see restricted or repetitive behavior, repetitive behavior like uh, flailing or flapping, uh, um, echolalia, sometimes they'll focus on a different or uh, specific sound, right? Uh, so the uh, on, when you're seeing high functioning autism, they still require some uh, support and they're going to have difficulty initiating social interactions uh, and they'll have difficulty switching between activities and problems with interaction and uh, having conversations. Um, usually there's like a natural flow that you kind of feel intrinsically in a conversation, but they might have a very hard time with that natural flow, knowing when to stop speaking, knowing when to start speaking. Uh, so you're seeing social impairment. Uh, level two, autism. Uh, you're going to see more uh, support required. Uh, there are going to be marked differences, uh, deficient, uh, sorry, deficiencies uh, with social interactions, uh, the same inflexi inflexibility of behavior, uh, they're going to have um, not only difficulty switching activities, but they might experience distress. So if you have a five-year-old with level two autism and uh, they're playing with blocks and you try to get them to leave or play with another toy, uh, they might fight you on it. They might throw a tantrum. Uh, uh, they, they might be more resistant. It might be more upsetting to them. Then we have severe autism. Uh, where you're seeing all the same symptoms, but much more severe. Uh, so these uh, children are going to have uh, much more of a need for support, more therapy, right? Uh, the, uh, yeah, and um, so the uh, going into adulthood, uh, especially with early intervention, um, children will start to learn how to better read social cues. There still are going to be some uh, deficiencies and there are some things that are going to be a little bit harder, uh, but there are many um, people with high functioning autism that you might not even realize have high functioning autism. Uh, so that is autism spectrum disorder in a nutshell. And once again, not caused by vaccines. Don't don't say that. It's just wrong. Then we have the dissociative uh, disorders. Uh, so usually our minds are one big uh, glob of consciousness, uh, but sometimes we split from our conscious minds. Uh, did you see the emphasis on split? Do you get the you get the joke. This is the movie Split by M. Night Shyamalan. Uh, I almost butchered that, right? And it is about a, uh, the villain has a dissociative identity disorder. Now, of course, that is a movie and that is a highly fictionalized portrayal of dissociative identity disorder. Not everybody has a beast within them uh, that is super strong and maybe a demon. I never actually saw the movie. Uh, but the uh, that is what is called dissociative identity disorder. It used to be called multiple personality disorder, but uh, due to those changes that I mentioned in the DSM, it's technically not a personality disorder. It's a dissociative disorder. So what we're seeing in dissociative identity disorder is oftentimes there's a traumatic moment, the mind uh, dissociates and creates another personality uh, which takes over uh, the body and uh, that personality will likely have a different name, different interests, different voice. 
so uh, you might be talking to Professor uh, Thompson at one point, and then uh, when uh, you get an email uh, from me, it's signed Karen. Hello, I'm Karen. Uh, so the uh, that is dissociative identity disorder. The thing about uh, DID is that um, during these splits, uh, usually the um, so uh, I, Professor Thompson, might not even be aware that Karen is taking over my body sometimes. Uh, so the split could happen without my conscious awareness. Oftentimes in early stages of dissociative identity disorder, uh, the alters, which are which is the scientific name for the personalities, aren't even aware of one another. There's also dissociative amnesia. Uh, so sometimes you might forget specific things. So this is an amnesia that's related to actual physical damage to the brain. Uh, this is due to some psychological stress. So maybe I have an event that's so stressful. Maybe I got into a car accident and the police uh, later asked me, okay, well, what happened? And I cannot remember uh, the accident, not because my brain got damaged in the accident, but because it was so frightening that I split from the experience. And then we have dissociative fugue disorder, uh, uh, formerly referred to as amnestic fugue disorder, uh, but it's essentially when a person loses their identity and flees to uh, a different uh, part of uh, you know maybe the state or maybe they cross states right they flee far away from their place of origin and create a new identity uh, so that is a dissociative fugue so when we're talking about psychosis uh, we oftentimes are talking about schizophrenia uh, so schizophrenia is the most common, the one that you'll hear about the most often, but I'll also discuss some of the others. So when we're talking about psychotic disorders, we split them into positive and negative symptoms. Uh, so positive symptoms refer to things that were, are there now, but weren't there before. Negative symptoms are the lack of things. Uh, so for example, uh, affect is our ability to kind of respond with our faces and bodies to things. So if I'm happy, my face is smiling. If I'm sad, my face is frowning. Uh, the But if I'm showing flattened affect, then my face isn't actually showing what I'm feeling. So maybe if I'm really happy about something, I talk about it like this. If I'm really sad about something, I talk about it like this. If I'm really mad at you, I talk to you like this. If I'm afraid of you, I talk to you like this, right? That'll be flat affect. You might also see reductions in sleep or disorganized, uh, uh, oh, sorry, reductions in speech or disorganized speech. Uh, so similar to what we talked about in uh, Bipolar 1 and Manic episodes, uh, you might see similar issues with speech uh, or you might see that Yeah, words. Mm. Uh. Right, uh, so kind of like a loss of expressive speech or sometimes uh, you'll hear a word salad, uh, which is just people saying words that don't seem to make sense one thing after another. Um, I've recently uh, had a couple experiences with um, people who are um, slightly psychotic. I can't diagnose them, but um, I had a uh, person who was talking to me and it was very hard to understand what this person was talking about. Uh, so uh, the conversation with her was, um, she just called me out of the blue uh, and she was like, um, uh, yeah, and you know, uh, I've been locked uh, away for so long. I've been locked away, and you know, my energy 
uh, was being taken from me because of the chemicals and all the the chemicals are they're just so bad for you and my spirit like the 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 lock was unlocked and I'm in the process of unlocking myself and freeing myself and the 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 things that they did to me the thing the the they were the uh, I was a prisoner right uh, now the uh, I I combined uh, reduced speech and disorganized speech uh, but the uh, you you can see that there is a fear. Uh, what you're also seeing are what are called delusions, delusional thinking. Uh, so I don't know uh, what specifically she was referring to, but you can hear this kind of like persecutory, paranoid delusion where she feels like people are out to harm her, right? Uh, so you can see delusions, you can see paranoia. You might also see hallucinations, which are sensory experiences beyond what is actually there. So right now, I'm in my room. I am by myself. Uh, there is no one talking to me. No, no, I just said that there's no one talking to me. No, they, they know that. Yeah, no, I said that there's no one. Uh, so sometimes you might see somebody having a conversation by themselves. Now, sometimes we have conversations by ourselves, but the the frequency and the type of conversation. So there's a difference between somebody going, uh, um, you know, if you're driving, you're just like, oh, oh, I forgot the dumb i forgot to get butter jeff you're so dumb jeff oh jeff you big dumb dumb right versus no you're not going to forget the butter the butter no you're not going to forget it this time you're good you're good and you you do good you're good right uh the that slight change in how it's presented really makes a difference uh so sometimes uh, you might see somebody uh, um, have psychotic symptoms for less than a month. Uh, that is not yet schizophrenia. That is what's called brief psychotic disorder. Uh, less than a, a six months, but more than one month is schizophreniform disorder. And when you have it for more than six months, that is schizophrenia. Uh, there's also what's called schizoaffective disorder. By the way, notice uh, that it's not schizophrenia, as some people say, it's schizophrenia. Uh, there's no T in there. Uh, so schizoaffective disorder is when you see mood symptoms uh, in addition to uh, psychological symptoms, uh, or sorry, psychotic symptoms. Uh, so the person might be having hallucinations, uh, they might be delusional, and they might also feel depressed at the same time. Uh, so that would be schizoaffective disorder. We've talked about the body-mind connection, so now we're going to talk about some somatic symptom disorders. The most, uh, the one that's most kind of representative of this category is what's called conversion disorder. So you might see somebody uh, experience blindness, paralysis, or some other symptom related to the nervous system that can't just be explained by a physical illness or in, uh, injury. So if I got into a car accident and I hit the back of my head and I was having trouble seeing or processing visual stimuli, uh, that would be conversion, or that would uh, not be conversion disorder because it was caused by damage to the brain, right? It could be explained by injury. Now, if I'd been stressed preparing for finals, and then one day as I wake up, I uh, wake up blind, I go get my brain checked, I go get my eyes checked, right? Everything is working properly, but I'm still uh, blind, then the stress is probably causing that blindness. So that could be conversion disorder. 
You might also be familiar with hypochondriasis, uh, which is the obsession with the fact that you might have some uh, very serious but undiagnosed medical condition. It's now referred to as illness anxiety disorder, but you know, you have like uh, an itch on your hand and you know, your hand's been pretty itchy recently and you're like, oh, must be cancer, must be cancer. Uh, I need to go check it out. I need to go get an x-ray. I might need somebody to cut it out. There's a lump in there. I feel like it's growing, right? Uh, when I try to stretch my hand, uh, it, you know, it hurts. Uh, so that, um, now you could actually have something wrong with your hand, but that obsession with having that, uh, uh, a serious, uh, undiagnosed medical condition, even despite proof to the contrary, would be an example of illness anxiety disorder. Uh, then we also have factitious disorder, which is when somebody is creating illness in their own body. Uh, so uh, a lot of people might do this uh, to um, for some sort of external gain. Uh, so maybe it's praise or pity uh, or uh, attention, right? Uh, that would be factitious disorder. Now, you may have heard of Munchausen by proxy. Uh, when you see, um, or if you are not familiar, parents will sometimes uh, poison their kids to make them sick and stay sick. Uh, and uh, that is Munchausen's by proxy. They make their kids sick and then People will congratulate them for being such a caring parent. People will uh, sometimes give them gifts and things like that. Uh, so that's Munchausen's by proxy. Also, if you happen to have Hulu, I highly recommend seeing the show The Act. Uh, it is about uh, a, a mother and daughter uh, and Munchausen's by proxy, and it uh, can be very emotionally uh, upsetting sometimes, but it is a very good representation of what that might look like and the course of the disease over a long period of time. So finally, we're going to talk about personality disorders. Personality disorders uh, are, as you might guess, uh, issues relating to a person's self and their core functioning, i.e. their personality. Uh, they are a bit controversial because when you are saying that somebody's personality is problematic, right, and that is who they are at their core, you're making a judgment statement often about that person. So you have to be very careful. Personality disorders also aren't diagnosed until the 18. Uh, the age of 18, the reason for that being that who we are changes over time, right? So at 18, we start to cement into a specific personality. The first one that I want to introduce is antisocial personality disorder. People who have this disorder are called sociopaths or psychopaths. And the uh, reason for this is uh, antisocial personality disorder isn't uh, this is an antisocial meaning like, oh, I don't enjoy uh, hanging out with people. I just want to be like a homebody and be by myself. Antisocial means uh, ignoring social rules and norms. Uh, so they uh, have a long-term pattern of disregard for the rights in, uh, of others. Uh, so they might lie, they might cheat, they might steal. Uh, oftentimes you'll see a uh, criminal history before the age of 18. Sometimes you'll uh, even see things like uh, they tortured small animals uh, when they were younger. Uh, that is antisocial personality disorder. Narcissistic personality disorder can look similar, uh, but it is a long-term pattern of feeling uh, self-important. Uh, in an exaggerated sense. You're constantly needing admiration and you have a lack of empathy towards other people. Uh, so what you might see is somebody who uh, lies to get to a position of power uh, and they, uh, they always talk about how great they are and how they're doing the best job. People who disagree with this person are obviously the worst people they don't know what they're talking about. Their information is fake. They're wrong. They're bad. 
but I am good. I am the best, right? Uh, so that would be a narcissist. A uh, schizoid is uh, actually what uh, you might think of when you think of antisocial. Uh, so the layman's term of antisocial means somebody who's not interested in socializing. That would be schizoid. Uh, they have a tendency towards a solitary life or a sheltered lifestyle, uh, and they just aren't interested really in other people. Then we have borderline personality disorder. Uh, somebody with borderline personality disorder tends to have unstable relationships, a kind of distorted, uh, distorted sense of self that can change depending on who they're in a relationship with. Uh, so if they were dating somebody who was goth, now they're goth. Then they date somebody who likes country music, now they're wearing a cowboy hat and cleats, right? Uh, or sorry, uh, I meant to say chaps, uh, but also maybe cleats too. Uh, and they have very strong emotional reactions. Uh, they could engage in self-harm or other dangerous or impulsive behaviors. And when I talked about splitting in the last chapter, I mentioned borderline. Uh, so they have a very hard time seeing people as gray. So you're either the best person in the world to them and you're great and they worship the ground that you walk on, uh, or you are uh, the scum of the earth to them. Uh, then we have histrionic personality disorder, and this is just basically a need to be the center of attention, and this is often done through uh, like pro uh, provocative dressing, uh, seduction, and other things like that. And then finally, we have uh, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, not to be confused with OCD, but these are people who are extreme perfectionists. Uh, they need things to be ordered and uh, organized the way they want it, uh, and they need to put their own standards on other people. So I do it this way, but you also need to do it this way. Uh, and that is Obsessive Compulsive Personality Disorder. So just real quick, because going through this, you might feel uh, like, oh, wait, do I have schizophrenia? Uh, do I have narcissistic personality disorder? More than likely, you do not. Uh, there's something called medical student's disease where uh, medical students, as they're going through their programs, every time they learn about a disease, they're worried that they might have it. This happens to psych students too. It is very unlikely that you have one of these it's very unlikely that you have all of these. Now, all of us have traits, right? Uh, you might notice uh, that like histrionic ran true to you or obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Uh, just because you have traits, just because you have some of these qualities doesn't mean that you have the full blown disorder. Now, if you are experiencing distress or impairment from these symptoms, uh, please don't take this as discouragement from seeking help. Anything that is causing you distress or impairment needs to be taken care of, needs to be dealt with. Uh, so if this lecture has pointed out uh, some things that you kind of assumed were normal and uh, might not be super normal, then seek the help of a, a healthcare professional. There are resources on campus. Uh, which can help you find uh, somebody off campus if you need one, uh, but don't let uh, uh, these things fester. Um, the one thing that's most important in treating uh, psychological illness is that you get early intervention. Early intervention is always the best.